Good afternoon. Uh, I hope you all have not fallen asleep from lunch and that I don't put you farther to sleep. Um, so I just thank by, start to th I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, just a brief introduction of who I am and why I'm talking to you. I, I'm trained as a physicist. Um, in my graduate work, I studied two systems, one of which is a colloidal system, which is a analog for, uh, oh no, oh no. The AV and it is fought back. Um, okay, be close to the mic. Great. Um, now I can't see my notes. <laughs> okay, we're still good? All right. Um, so it's a colloidal system, which is a uh, dense amorphous jam system, which is an analog for some glassy systems. And then I studied the vapor layer underneath the light and frost drop. I'll explain both of these a little more. Oh, come on. Um, this is an introduction. I'm currently at NSLS2 where I do data acquisition. I'm the current project lead of Matplotlib and I uh, was recently named a PSF fellow. Um, something I started doing is putting acknowledgments at the beginning of putting acknowledgments at the beginning of talks just to make sure they don't get rushed at the end. So I'd to start by thanking uh, Mike Dropboom, Eric Fearing, and the whole Matplotlib team. And Mike's actually right there in the second row. Um, when I was a grad student and started working in open source, they really are who taught me how to like do software uh, in a way that is usable by other people. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dan Allen, Ken Lauer, my colleagues at uh, BNL. They're really the core we built out Blue Sky with, and we learned quite a bit about how to build these systems from scratch together. And finally, I'd like to thank my wife, Dora. Um, she's also a developer and uh, you know contributed quite a bit to these slides as we talked. You know, she saw early versions of this talk going on as I was developing it. And of course, all just the, the support of through grad school and supporting my open source habit. Um, so I think this is probably an easy pitch for this room that like software is critical to the future of science. I know as I heard, as we heard in the keynote this morning, um, this link is to, you know, the, the site here is to a talk from Dan Katz, which he's giving either today or yesterday at a meeting in Europe of funders of, of research software. Uh, that has stats like 90% of academic or researchers report software is, is uh, they use software, and 60% say it's critical. And I suspect that the 40% who say it's not critical are lying either to themselves or the, the, the survey. Um, and the reason it's critical is software lets you ask different questions, right? There's things that you just can't do by hand because it's too big, it's too, it's too complex, you can't, you know, you, you know, we've moved on from analog film. Um, and finally, and really, something that's very interesting is that software lets you encapsulate techniques and analyses you've, you've, you've developed in a way that is natively shareable and reusable by other people. Um, so uh, the size of, the, of like modern science data is, you know, is one of the things driving, you know, drives us towards software. And the term big data gets thrown, a lot, gets thrown around a lot. You may ask like, what does that actually mean? And I think trying to go for like a, like a size in bytes is not the right metric. It's really bigger than your field is used to. Right, fields that have always been you know, heavily based on imaging, you know, getting into the gigabytes and terabytes a decade ago was normal. And like that's, you know, and they're, they're well past that now, but that was, you know, normal then. But there's some fields now that are getting to like the megabyte scale and are starting to run into these same problems. So it's really when the data gets bigger than you can deal with using your current techniques is when you feel you've moved to big data. Um, an interesting connection to my, my graduate work is um, the first measurements of colloids were, were done by uh, Jean-Baptiste Perrin um, you know, in 1908, uh, they actually did this with a very cool uh, physical optical setup where uh, called a camera lucidia, where in one eye you can see your microscope and in the other eye you can see a, like a drawing surface you can mark on. And they would just track by hand where the colloids were over time. And using this technique, they measured, you know, thousands of displacement vectors. Um, and, you know, um, Perrin got the Nobel Prize in 1926 uh, for this work because, you know, it proved that uh, molecules existed and, you know, settled if the world is continuous or made up of subatomic, you know, of small particles. Um, I also tracked rat particle undergoing Brownian motion in my graduate work. Uh, did not get the Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> however, the first, our keynote speaker tomorrow did. Um, and, but what I could do with software is that I could look at much, much larger fields of view. You know, Perrin was tracking one particle at a time. I was tracking 20,000 per frame at, I think, 10 hertz. You know, over thousands of frames, over hundreds of experiments. And by having this size, I can make measurements about the structure and dynamics of what these particles were doing that you couldn't access just by, by looking at smaller volumes. Um, 
the second project I worked on, which again, the, the software was critical to the work that I did, is, um, so this is, this is the view of the bottom of a liner frost drop. Uh, if you're not, that term may not be familiar, but you've all seen this effect. If you take a drop of water and throw it in a really hot frying pan, sometimes it like hits the surface and like boils immediately. And sometimes it like pops up in a little ball and skitters around. And that, that's the light and frost effect. And what's going on is as the drop's getting close, close enough, it starts evaporating and you get a vapor layer between the drop and the surface. And it acts like a, uh, a puffer coat and keeps the drop from, insulates the drop from the hot surface and it can live far longer than it could. And it's now frictionless like on its own little air table. Um, the lab I was in had developed a technique to use interference imaging to look, uh, at, you know, look at the gap between a fluid layer and a, and a surface. And uh, a postdoc in lab, Justin Burton, uh, you know, did this with a line of frost drop and got images that look very much like this one. And what you're seeing here is as you go around the ring, you can see my mouse, is that every time you go from a light fringe to a dark fringe around, you're either going up or down by a quarter wavelength of light. And so using this technique, you can very carefully measure uh, the variation of the thickness of this, um, of the gap. Um, Justin looked at this, you know, went into image J and clicked off these points by hand and me you know, measured the profile of the rim by hand. Uh, and like, this was a new and interesting result because it's always been assumed to be like, uniform around the rim. I published a paper and like, this was great. Um, I saw this in group and he said, I bet you could automate that and get a time series. Um, Justin didn't agree, we had some discussions and I, you know, I, uh, I saw, settled it by just doing it. Um, and this should also tell you, Justin's now a, a professor at Emory and I, I do what I do, so this should be clues of where our careers are going. Um, so, you know, I took a couple of weeks to get the first version working. About you know six to seven months later, uh, there's some usable code that I pulled out and put on GitHub as its own standalone project. And about 18 months after that, I wrote up my my, my paper on this and graduated. Um, so, before the next slide, I just want you to imagine the slice around this ring and the up and down patterns of the, of the fringes as we go through. So what we see here is that each vertical line in this is one of those slices around an image and as we go horizontally, we go through time. So what we're watching is the evolution of this rim as it varies. The, anything that's basically a constant color of darker light is at the same height between all those frames and then it's colored by the overall height of these things. So by you know, chugging through about a terabyte of raw like high-speed imagery. Um, I had access to a 3,000 frame per second camera. Uh, I could extract out these very interesting rim dynamics over very long periods of time. Uh, and this really could not have been done by hand, right? You can't do, you can't click on a hundred something fringes and 100,000 frames and expect to graduate, you know, in your lifetime. Um, your professors might disagree, but you can't. Uh, so uh, I mentioned I pulled that, that code out, you know, I pulled the, tracked by this, you know, a bit of reusable code that was for linking features between frames. Um, and just over a decade ago, which is a terrifying thing to say, I got this email from a colleague uh, who said, you know, I, you know, there's a common technique in our field. I would implemented one half of it, he didn't implement the other. Maybe we should be friends. Um, in the end, we ended up merging our code bases. Uh, he was gracious enough to keep, let the project keep the name I'd given it. Um, and at this point, about 30 people have contributed to this project and even though Dan and I have both mo mostly moved on from this type of research, this project has become self-sustaining. Um, and about a year and a half, well, a couple of years after, you know, Dan graduated about a year after I did and then joined me at Brookhaven and has been, you know, been uh, there with me ever since and has definitely been my closest and most meaningful collaborator for the last seven or eight years. Um, I think this brings up both science and software have this, this myth that a lone genius is the, is the, you know, is the archetype that's going to work, right? Like one person alone can solve it. And I think this is really harmful. Um, to some degree, science as a whole is a collaborative effort to collectively understand the world, right? We don't publish solely to game our age indexes. We publish to share information with other people so they can then build on it and, and you know, build our collective understanding of the world. Uh, similarly, like any useful software these days is bigger than one person can like even physically write you know, by themselves in their lifetime. Right? If you think about the amount of engineering effort that goes from I'm running a Jupyter notebook displaying machine learning models all the way down through like the Fortran and GPU code that it takes to run that, like that's a stupendous amount of engineering effort that no one person could do. Um, and just as my observation that 
any piece of software I've written in collaboration with someone else has been a better piece of software than any software I've written by, only by myself. I think just the having more than one point of view, having more than one person thinking about it, is just invaluable in making sure you get good results. And uh, this is at least the second time this, this, this picture is shown up at this uh, conference. Um, this is from, I, I think it's from, from Jake Vanderplas's 2015 SciPy keynote, uh, showing you know, kind of the rings of the SciPy Thermometer system. And everything I've talked about so far was built entirely on this stack. And interestingly, the, uh, TrackPy, that piece of software that's a byproduct of Dan and I's research, has now been cited almost 300 times in a variety of domains well outside of the, the field Dan and I worked in, which is a subsection of soft science matter physics, you know, including uh, climate. One of the papers is, track, you know, is using TrackPy to track uh, ships in the Atlantic to find correlations with clouds and then climate change. You know, biomedical things like high impact journals, like this has been, the impact of that software has been far greater than the impact of the actual academic research that motivated it, at least in my case. Um, another uh, measure, measure, way we can measure the impact of the scientific Python community overall is looking at what fraction of papers uh, on the archive uh, we think include a matplotlib figure. Um, it's been true for a while, back to like uh, 07 or something for a PDF and like the early aughts for the, vector, the raster backends, that as part of writing out a, f a file for matplotlib, uh, and there's a standard metadata like producer that tells you what piece of software wrote this file. I think the intent is so that if you've got a broken SVG, you know who to go file the bug report with. Uh, but because this watermark is there and will survive the process of making a PDF, if you just, gra you know, just grab every P PDF on the archive and search for the byte string matplotlib, you can determine if that paper has a matplotlib figure in it or not. Um, and about a month ago, uh, Matt Rocklin, who is here someplace, uh, we were chatting at a, at, a, at a meeting, and he wrote some DAS code that in about five minutes will chew through the terabyte of archive data and to answer this question. And so you can see here that you know, over time, we're now at something like 17% of papers on the archive uh, include matplotlib. And this is definitely a floor because there's some post-processing steps that will strip it out. And this is all papers, not just papers that include a figure. Um, so like, you know, as a community, we're having a huge impact on science, at least the parts of science that are publishing to archive. Um, so, a, you might want to ask, like, how can you think about doing software in a way that means that, may, that, may, that makes sure your software will have an impact and not just be your little, you know, collection of scripts that do that solve your problem and no one else's. Um, and this is an analogy, actually, um, that I, I, I'm stealing from Peter Wang of uh, Anaconda. Uh, whereas if we think about what's above the waterline here, that's kind of the application. That's the code that's solving the problem you actually want to solve. Because again, like we don't write software just for like fun. I mean, it is fun, but that's not why we do it, right? You always write software to do something else, right? There's some, there's some goal you want to get done that this, the software is a tool to do. And so what's above the waterline is the tool that's doing whatever it is you want. Um, and if you compare the top and bottom of this diagram, you know, what's about the waterline is about the same. Like, yeah, okay, I could have made the, the volcanoes flat, but details. Um, however, if you wanted to then expand, uh, you know, and do something out here, like kind of between the first and second, if it's, a, you know, in the volcano model, you're, you know, you have to do some work. You have to get below the waterline, dig in. But you don't have to go all the way to the seafloor. Whereas in the matchstick model, if you've built a very specific, you know, vertically integrated application, when you, you have to dig all the way to the bottom, or build all the way to the bottom for any new thing you want to build. And you can think of the history of the, you know, of the scientific Python ecosystem over the last two, really two decades now as this process of building the volcanoes up slowly and slowly as more, you know, from the foundational libraries, more and more domain-specific libraries are built. And it's easier and easier for people who just want to get something done to uh, find the tool that solves their problems. So some uh, Concrete ways, you know, a way to think of this distinction is to think about software being either library-like library -like or application-like. It's not, this is not the, the only access you can store software, it's not the best, it is not, may not be the best, but it's an interesting access to think about. And that, so in an application, like, its job is to solve a problem for me right now. Like, I need to get something done, you know, I as a human have a goal, and this software is going to help me do it. On the other hand, a you know, if you're thinking more like a library, your goal is to solve a class of problems for someone else at some other time. That someone else may be you in the future, but like you're 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 thinking a little more generally, um, and that really 
there's kind of this distinction where an application really is used by a human. The output of that application is goes into someone's eyeballs and like they understand it and advance their own objectives. Whereas in a library, the output is then used by other code. And these, you know, this helps drive some of your design decisions. Um, in an application, you can make many, many assumptions because you say like, you know, I'm making an application to visualize, you know, the the penguins on these two islands, and then. You can then, based on the user input, you can say that, you know, you're active about dogs. I don't do that. I know, you know, did you misspell penguins? That wasn't a great analogy. <laughs> uh, whereas in the library case, you want to make many fewer assumptions. You still need to make some, but many fewer so that you, your, your tool is usable to as many people as possible. So you want to leave it up to the application developers to bring their applications to the problem, their assumptions to the problem. Um, Similarly, an application may be very opinionated about I.O. It says, I need TIFF files named in such and such a way with such metadata in, in the fields. And in a library, you probably you want to be as agnostic as possible to where, you know, how the data got to you. You really want to take in you know, NumPy arrays, pandas data frames, you know, Python data types, things in memory that you, know, you don't care where it came from, you don't care where it's going, but your job is to work on that data. Um, and finally, in an application, you never want to fail, right? Like, you should, you should try to guess what the user wanted to do. You should make, you know, because you're making those assumptions, you try to be helpful. And if, in the worst case scenario, you send like a nice error message like, I'm sorry, please, you know, please try again. In the case of a library, you want to fail as hard and fast as possible if something's not what you expect. Because you want to raise that exception. So again, so the application developer can catch that exception and then bring their assumptions as to how to solve this. Um, a, you know, a pictorial way of looking at this is if in a very abstracted sense, if the horizontal axis is all the things you might want to do with a computer, and the vertical, vertical axis is how hard it is to do that. In the case of an application, you have this, this energy landscape, essentially, that's very, you know, has a very, very deep, narrow gap. And if you want to do what that application does, like, your life is great, like, it just works, you're happy, and, like, you can move on with whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, in the case of a library, it's never going to be as easy as an application to do any given thing. Uh, but if you want to move away from the initial thing that the authors imagined, in the case of an application, you're going to, you, you know, it's very likely to hit this cliff and like either it's not possible or you end up find, you know, end up building like elaborate constructs to work around the assumptions the library make that were different than you wanted to make. Application made that was different than you wanted to make. Whereas a library, it's a little harder, but you've got this much gentler energy landscape that as you go away, it's still possible, and you can then build your own application with your assumptions, bringing that that um, <laughs> valley down someplace else. So, trying to f make this even more concrete and find a case study that fit two versions of which on the same screen at a font size that was readable in this room was surprisingly hard. This is a bit <laughs> contrived, but bear with me. So, let's say you have um, directories of TIFF files. The there's something about what sample the, the, that was a, is a picture of is in the directory name. And then for your analysis, you need to know the temperature that was taken at. And that happens to be uh, if you split the file name by underscores, it's in the third section, but you have to drop the C because it carries units. I mean, units are good, but you can't make them into integers. Um, I, yeah. So if, taking an application point of view, we could write some code that looks like this. You know, we use pathlib to get a glob. Uh, we loop over those file names. We use tiff file to open up. That gets us the actual image. Uh, we then do a bunch of string munging and path munging to see this information out. And then we do, you know, a trip, you know, in this case, a trivial computation. But you can imagine this being much more elaborate about, you know, whatever you're trying to do. And, like, this works. And if your goal is, like, I got this directory of files and I need to process them right now to answer a question, this is, this is a good choice of what to do. On the other hand, if you're thinking more as a library, you might want to make a function that takes in that file name and returns the parsed data, at, you know, sample name and temperature. And then in your analysis, we've changed that for loop just into a list, into a dictionary comprehension. And where what we're iterating over is the actual values we care about. And so now if, if next week when, uh, you know, the, the unnamed grad student who is yourself decides to add a fourth section on the front, and now suddenly you have to get the fourth split, not the third, Right. In, the, in the application case, you have to go through and rewrite every place that you've ever used, you know, copy-pasted this code around your code base. I mean, I've never done that, I swear. Um, whereas in the library case, you know, you can uh, you just write a new function and then you just switch out which function you use, you know, as, as you need. So a little, more, a, bit, a little bit more upfront investment, but 
hopefully a payoff in the long term as your code is more flexible and maintainable. Um, and so, uh, obviously, not every not every every piece of code needs to turn into like a widely used foundational library. Like, the, like if we only did that, we would we'd miss the point because again, no one's doing the actual things this you know the computers exist for. But what are some questions that can kind of drive you a little bit more towards that library mindset as you develop your code? So the, f the first thing I was trying to think of was like, what assumptions are you making? Right, every time you write a piece of code, that's encoding some assumption that you're making about what, pro what problem you're trying to solve, what the parameters of the problem are, and like why you're doing it. So just be careful to think through what those actually are. And sometimes you'll catch yourself like, oh, I don't want to assume this will always be a file name structure exactly like this. Maybe I should take it in an array. Um, a second thing I like to think about is if I make this choice, what won't I be able to do in the future? Because again, you know, waterfall from software don't really work, right? Everything we do is always agile, particularly in a research context where you know, who, you know, the, the researcher at the coal faces, they're doing whatever they need to do to get through the day. And in six months, their needs, your you know, your needs, their needs, whichever pronoun speaks better to you, uh, may be different. And so if you think ahead of like, if I make this choice, what can't I do? might help drive you to make sure you don't paint yourself into a corner. Um, a, a more positive version of that is, um, you know, if you look a little bit ahead and say, not what problem am I trying to solve, not just what problem am I trying to solve today, but what problem am I trying to, going to try to solve next week or next month? And am I designing this in a way that it's going to be flexible enough to extend in that direction when I need to? I'm not going to build it now, but I'll lay, make sure, you know, I'll lay the track or I have, have like a quasi plan of how I would get there if I needed it. Um, and then, I think just a, a bit of discipline I've, I've had good success with is think carefully of what information a given part of your code needs to know. You know, kind of think like uh, the security agencies, you know, need to know. Because if you, if a piece of your code knows a piece of information, you're going to eventually use it there. And now you've made, now you've made it so that piece of code always needs to know that information. And that induces lots of coupling between your code, you know, between your code. And if you're able to restrict the smallest information you can to do its job, you know, it might, it will push you towards writing more modular maintainable code. Um, and finally, if you do have users, uh, you know, you need to think about like, who am I going to break? What is the cost of this change? If this is a function in a, you know, a, a module that you, that's next to your script, you know, the, you just, you break the API, you fix the, you fix the scripts and you move on. But if you're something at the scale of matplotlib, you know, if we break, you know, if we put a major breaking change in, like, 10 million people might have changed their code. And so you need to think through, like, what the consequences of that change are going to be. Um, so uh, a place where we've applied a number of these ideas is uh, the Blue Sky project that we've been working on at BNL. This is a system for, um, di you know, orchestrating data acquisition of experimental uh, data. Um, not going to talk through this large diagram. Um, I think we, we've been relatively successful in this project. It's about somewhere between five and seven years along. Um, it's currently running all the science operation at NSLS2. We have something like 1,300 researchers come in every year. Um, and, you know, and about 550 papers come out of data pub done, published, collected at NSLS2 every year. Um, and this software has also been adopted by other DOE light sources, so our peers around the country, our peers at, uh, internationally. Uh, in addition to working in the facility scale, this has actually scaled down very well to university labs and individual researchers. I mean, I think, I think why this, this project has worked out so well is that from the beginning, we very intentionally designed, developed this as a collection of co-designed, so like the same people built, built all of these, but technically independent libraries. Um, and this, this has actually paid off in the sense that one of our university collaborators uh, ripped an entire subcomponent out and replaced it with their own and are able to you know, make use of the rest of the, the ecosystem, but not the part they don't like. Um, and also, we, did, we, we developed this in the open from the start. Um, you know, as soon as we had anything halfway, halfway working, it was on GitHub uh, BSD <coughs> license. Um, this meant anyone could see the code. Anyone could see, you know, see our discussions about where to drive the code and how we came to decisions. And some of our early collaborators uh, helped influence the direction the code went to make sure that it was meeting their needs as well as ours. And in many cases, their needs actually were needs we had that we hadn't understood yet. Um, and this worked out very well. And so if you happen to own any experimental like laboratory equipment that you'd like to automate with Python, uh, we're always looking for 
uh, new collaborators. Um, another thing I've been kind of skirting around in this, in this so far is the concept of like maintaining an open source project, right? And like what, what does it mean to be an open source maintainer and like how do you go about doing that? And I think fundamentally it, the, how you define a maintainer is someone who feels responsible for the project. That could be an intrinsic motivation just because they really like the project and want to help. It could be extrinsic because they're being paid. But at the end of the day, if you feel responsible for the project, you are a maintainer of that project. Um, then what, what tools do you need to be successful at this? I think the first and most critical thing is a stewardship mindset, not an ownership mindset of the code. Right? Once, you, once the project is, is used and has users, it's no longer your code. Right? This is code that's used by a bunch of people to solve, presumably solve real problems they have. And you are currently the steward of that code. And you're, you're, so you're, you're responsible for taking care of it. But like, it's not yours. Um, and that also frequently you may join, like historically I joined a number of projects that existed well before I was involved. And so like obviously I don't, I, it's not mine. Um, and also I like the, all the projects I've worked on, like I think they're useful and I'd like them to continue once, I, once I've moved on. I don't want, necessarily want to be tied to you know, something I chose to put online 15 years ago forever. Um, second, I think you, you need to have a lot of empathy to be a maintainer. Um, you know, in these big open source projects, everyone's coming from a different place. Uh, this could be, you know, life experience, you know, background, education, domain, you know, just across the board, you know, you talk to everyone. And, it, you know, it takes some effort to make sure you can get, find a common ground uh, with those people to have a useful discussion. And also, if your tool is being useful to someone and they come to you with a bug report, it's because whatever they're trying to do just got ruined by what by your code, and they're having a pretty bad day. I'm like, be kind to them. Like, they're, they're, they're yeah, they're having a bad day. It's not their fault. <laughs> I mean, it might be their fault, but. Uh, <laughs> and, second, and then third, I think, you know, these successful projects really are community, you know, are maintained by a community of people. Um, and, you know, to be maintained, you need to be able to work with people, you need to have people skills. And you should definitely go to Melissa's keynote tomorrow, where she'll talk about our, our efforts to improve this in the Python world. And then finally, like, you do need some technical skills. But frankly, this is the easiest part. Right? This is the most common, you know, almost everyone in this room, I bet, could, could has the technical skills to be a maintainer on, our, on these projects. But that's, yeah. Um, so you might ask, all these things I've been talking about, do I, do I still do science? Uh, no. No, I don't. <laughs> Um, I haven't. I haven't been the first author uh, in about eight years. Like, and I don't expect that to change. However, I've enabled a lot of science. You know, I've been. I've supported a lot of scientists. I've ended up on you know seventh and eighth authors on papers, that, having provided technical contributions. Um, and I think it's clear that the that no one has time to both be a domain expert in the science and a professional, professional software developer, right? Like, I've chosen to go the developer route and. I don't do domain research anymore. Um, however, this doesn't let scientists off the hook, right? Like, I think for a working scientist these days, given the criticality of software to science, you know, you have to be conversant. You have to, you know, it's a required professional skill. Just like, you know, if you're a physicist, you need to know linear algebra and calculus, you know. And if you do any sort of science, like, you need to be able to write papers. You need to be able to write grants. Like, that's just part of the professional function of the job. Um, I think this brings up the idea that you know the emerging role of a research software engineer that's starting to become uh, recognized as an important role in science. Um, this is a quote from the United States uh, Research Software Engineer Association. Uh, we like an inclusive definition of research software engineers to encompass those who regularly use expertise in programming to advance research. This includes researchers who spend a significant amount of time uh, programming, full-time software engineers who write code to solve research problems, and those somewhere in between. Um, I mean, that's a very broad definition, like that good, but to be a little more granular, I want to talk about like what a research engineer is not, right? This isn't a role for computer science research. This isn't about developing the latest and greatest new algorithms. This is about applying existing tools and techniques to solve a research problem in, in whatever your science domain is. Uh, this also shouldn't be, you know, what hunter fix my code. Um, you know, if you're a scientist and you, you you hire someone in a role like this, you know, you might enjoy bossing a programmer around and like 
get some technical support, but you're going to be leaving a lot of um, expertise and capability on the table that when you didn't have to. If you think back to the questions I was talking about, like what you know, what a library mindset is, a lot of those are about understanding what the software is and why it is. And so the for a good real, you know, to have an RSC be successful, there really needs to be good communication between the engineer and the scientist. I know you, you know that you need to understand what assumptions are safe to make, which aren't. You know, where's where's the science likely to go next? And like, what are the right trade-offs? Right? Like, one of my uh, one of the scientists I work with at BNL has learned to stop asking me, "Can I do X?" Because I always say yes, but and then you know, explain why what he wants is actually a 15-year research project. But like, it's possible. Um, and the, it really needs to be a partnership and collaboration. Like the research engineers need to understand enough of the domain to have a conversation with the scientists about what they're doing and why. But symmetrically, the scientists need to have enough um, software expertise and understanding to you know, have, that, have a conversation with what the limit, you know, what the capability, what's possible, reasonable time frames, like all that sorts of things that go into designing a piece of software. So, um, Advice and conclusion, you've given me a soapbox. I'm going to give you some advice. Uh, use version control. Uh, no, really, use version control. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know how, long, how I'm doing on time, but if you want to see me have like flashback panic attacks, ask me at the time I deleted two years of research code with no backups. Um, so uh, software is essential to doing science. Again, I think this is an easy push in this room. Um, programming is a required skill for professional scientists. Um, if you're going to write any software, I, I strongly recommend that you have a library mindset from the start. Even if your goal is not to make this into a widely used package, you know, the, your future user is yourself in six months, and your future self will thank you for having put in that little bit of effort now when you were thinking about it to refactor in a way, to, you know, structure the code in a way that you, you can adapt it. Um, and again, if you, if you can, I strongly suggest working in the open from the start. I think science is better when it's collaborative. And you know the the, the the secret sauce of what you're doing is the is the data, not necessarily the analysis, right? We want to be able to reuse the analysis, and you know, I think you're more likely to find collaborators than someone who's going to scoop you. Uh, also, if it, if I was a grad student, if I put my research code up and you could do it, you could use it. Please come talk to me because I'm having trouble making it work. <laughs> uh, and finally, like make friends, build collaborations, and have fun, right? Like that's at the end of the day. I think that's the our high school. So with that, I'm going to leave you with a page of links and my contact. And I guess I'm not sure how, much, how long we have for questions. Five minutes? OK, we have five minutes for questions. Yes, I feel like whenever, at least in our research environment at work, we often have a lot of new people come in who have not been developers before, like fresh bioengineers out of college. They don't know how to structure a research project for code purposes. You have a, I have a guide that I like for that, but I do not know if it is an industry standard. Do you have an opinion on designing your research software code environment? So the, the, the question was, uh, you frequently get a lot of new people. The, uh, the asker has a guide of how they bring in their new people, and do I have a reference? Uh, I don't have a particular reference I go to. I tend to rant at people. Um, I mean, I, I learned by working on a big open source project, which is effective, but not yeah, is an effective method of doing that because you will quickly learn many of these things just by working in the code base. And I think some of these also, it's very hard to articulate some of these ideas. You really have to get in a big project and like see how it feels to get a sense of why some of these things matter and how to make the judgment calls that are needed. I think, the, so I think the question was how to, how to convince business leaders to build libraries, not applications. I, I don't have a good answer for that because I work in a weird quasi-academic institution. <laughs> Sorry. You this morning mentioned that uh, of research published that uses data and software, 60% you can't get the data even when you ask for it. Of those, only a quarter reproduced using the methods in the paper. Uh, you, you kind of talked a lot about the importance of working in the open and sharing your, your software. It doesn't seem like there's a 
coherent story for that with the data itself. Is this something you, you, you've encountered in your work, and how do you address that? So the question was, as, um, as mentioned in the keynote, that only 60, you know, that not all data is available, and of the data that's available, most of it doesn't reproduce. And if I've, that this does not have a coherent story about the data, this is mostly about software. Um, I think, well, uh, to some degree, yes, the, uh, come on, go all the way back. What we're working on at Brookhaven, everything in the bottom right corner of this is really designed to bring data to two analysis routines in a reliable, uh, reproducible, metadataful way uh, that ideally we can expose over, expose over HTTP, authenticated HTTP to the world and to try to solve that problem by just putting all the data in one place. However, uh, this is a space that I know a lot of people are very interested in. I know I've talked, I've had a conversation with Shell about this. Um, th this is a, that's a very good question and I don't think there is a super, there's a lot of answers and I don't know which one is best yet. Oh, <laughs> okay. So uh, this is—I was an undergrad, and the last task I had you know, as I was leaving, I was doing some undergrad research. My last task of leaving was to, uh, you know, clean up you know all the work I'd done, burn it to a DVD because it was that long ago, um, and you know, editors like will create like the temporary files where it's like file name squiggle. And I said, oh, I don't want to back up those forever on DVD. So I typed RM space star space squiggle, enter, <laughs> and deleted two years of MATLAB. Uh, had a panic, you know, basically on the floor and tried to breathe for five minutes. Uh, fortunately, I had also been like adding comments and like editing. So I happened to have every single file open in a text editor. <laughs> <laughs> so I went through and like, put a space in and saved again. So I ended up not losing anything, but like that was a scarring experience and now everything goes in version control immediately. <laughs> there are people who back up and there are people who do back up. <laughs> yes. Um, is that? Oh, one question actually. Okay. Um, how, 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 does, how do you kind of like in an academic environment, kind of like navigate between being able to also like so the question is in an academic setting, unlike the business setting, how do you convince um, you know, PIs and other researchers that these things are important? Um, that, that's also a hard question. Uh, <laughs> the, the comment is, how do you convince PIs of anything, which is true. They're, uh, yeah, Shell says money, which is... Not, not, a, not, not true. yeah, it's a reasonable path. Um, <laughs> I think the best you can do is show success. If you do these, you know, over the course of my graduate career, at the beginning, you know, my lab mates were like nerd. Uh, but by the end, as I was able to turn out cool stuff, some of them started like paying attention to what I was doing and start, started adopting some of the techniques themselves. So I think, you know, do you, you know, be successful, and, you know, that's for sure. Okay, that's terrible advice. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, if you find people who are interested in listening, work with them instead of necessarily going at, tilting at windmills that are not interested in moving right now. At least at the grassroots level, I think that's, that's the technique I would take. If you're, if you're higher up, there's politics that are above my head where you can, like, go after money, but... Uh, so the the, the, co the comment from the crowd was that postdocs are actually in an extremely good position to be the lever to change the culture within academic departments because they probably were recently in the trenches doing it and have enough wiggle room that and like you know imply an authority that they can make these changes and advocate it for them whereas a first year student probably can't with that, I think, are we at time? Yep, we're at time. Great.